Hello everybody. At the outset, I would like to express my uh, thanks to the organizing committee for allowing my YouTube presentation. And I would be making a short presentation on endoscopic hemisphere automate technique which we developed in our center. And these are the preliminary papers which we published and more recently we are coming up with a supplement in epilepsy. And following this, we published uh, another paper on uh, endoscopic assisted corpus callosotomy with anterior hippocampal and posterior commissurotomy, especially for kids who are having uh, severe drop attacks with Lennox just taught. Now, we started our uh, first hemispherotomy way back in 2002, and this was a kid who was in status, and you can see one of the incisors were missing because he uh, was intubated when he came to hospital, and we performed this procedure in a semi-emergency and you can see that this child is a young man in 2015. Now soon we performed the first ever series and also published uh, a series of hemispherotomy from India. Now all of us know that the standard uh, hemispherotomy consists of a vertical technique or a lateral approach and uh, uh, whichever approach we do uh, the indications remain same most often and these include commonly the Rasmussen's post infarct, hemimegalencephaly, hemispheric cortical dysplasia and we firmly believe that the future would be an endoscopic technique and this would be a step ahead in evolution of the hemispheric surgeries. Uh, the reasons could be multitude which we published later in a review paper. Uh, the most important is the reason of uh, development of uh, high definition optics and uh, the scopes becoming low profile and having combination of neuro navigation with the scopes and also having uh, the ability to maneuver scopes more properly because of development of very good endoscopic holders. Uh, we understand that among various surgeries hemispherotomy has one of the best outcomes uh, in epilepsy surgery and because it's performed in kids, it's, it's very important to make this uh, technique as minimally invasive as possible. Now, before we started the surgery, there was only one study which showed endoscopic technique in a cadaver. And this was never translated in humans because of the reasons of the picture which you can see here, which shows that you have to insert two endoscopes, which a surgeon will understand that it's never possible. So we went ahead and miniaturized the vertical approach and instead of going transcortical we started using endoscopic assistant to go into our hemispheric and that's the kind of incision we give uh, it's it's very important to have a very good endoscopic holder we have the luxury of using a rosa robot and it's also very important to have a irrigating irrigating bionated bipolar which can actually pass into nooks and cannies of the uh, uh, surgical site now, you, you can see that when we use a robot attached to an endoscope, it provides six axes of motion very uh, easily and it, it doubles up both as a navigation tool as well as a, as well as a holding device. Um, now, we started off with simple uh, atrophic cases as they provide the best view of anatomy as it can be seen here. And uh, later on, we progressed to uh, more complex cases like Rasmussen's which can be seen in the next diagram and the diagram below shows the immediate post-op intra-op MRI images and uh, once we got an experience uh, we were then able to go in for non-atrophic cases but for beginners I would seriously advise that you should do it in atrophic cases now that's the case of an hemispheric cortical dysplasia and the row of pictures on the second row shows the beautiful disconnection which has been done using the endoscopic technique uh, so uh, this represents the most complex aspect of the endoscopic hemispherotomy surgeries. Another example of a hemimegalencephaly with left facial hypertrophy and that's the post-op CD scan and uh, if you see the MRI image it clearly outlines the line of disconnection which can be seen here and it shows the advantage of the endoscopic approach because it enters into the cistern between the two hemispheres and then follows a transcalosal and the transventricular route so as a result provides the best possible access and ingress for the endoscope now this shows basically the three important steps of the procedure which is 
uh, first is corpus callosotomy the step two is anterior and middle disconnection and the step three is posterior disconnection now this video shows uh, how this procedure is performed in an atrophic case so you can see the craniotomy which is about four centimeters long and three centimeters wide so i use endoscope right from beginning so you do not see the circle around it because it's highly magnified so initially i use it as an exoscope and later on i use it as an endoscope so the uh, brain is retracted from the fox and once the csf is let out there would be space created and now the endoscope is taken inside in order to visualize the interhemispheric cistern which can be opened up with a sharp dissection now these are the two atus and the corpus callosum which can be dissected with a sharp dissection and then separated so as to expose the corpus callosum nicely so if i do the exposure of corpus callosum from anterior to back to posterior I start corpus callosotomy from the posterior aspect just to avoid the endoscope being taken anteriorly again. So this is a splenium which is now being exposed. Now as you can notice that I use the standard microsurgical instruments uh, maybe they are longer than what is used routinely. So I prefer to go either in between the two A2s or I gently retract the A2 to one side and then go on the opposite side. And when I do the corpus callosotomy, it's important that I open not into the cavum but into the ipsilateral pathological ventricle. So in this case, if I'm planning to do a right hemispherotomy, I should open into the right lateral ventricle. So that's the corpus callosotomy which is being performed. The geno is being cut. And you can see the curve of both the A2s. And then the corpus callosotomy is proceeded posteriorly. That's the splenium being cut. So now you can see the choroid fissure and the choroid plexus of the ipsilateral ventricle coming into view. Now the endoscope is carried forward. And now you can see the A2 is curving around the genu of the corpus callosum. So the endoscope is rotated. The camera is rotated till we get the proper anatomical perspective. And now we are starting to perform the anterior disconnection, which is a transverse disconnection which starts at the junction of A2 and the geno of the corpus callosum medially and goes till the lateral part of head of caudate nucleus. It passes, it goes inferiorly till we hit the posterior part of the anterocranial fossa. And medially, it's essential that the entire brain is sucked off till we reach the subarachnoid uh, plane. Now I feel that this is another use of endoscope because of the ex excellent visualization. We are able to ensure that complete disconnection is performed. The retractors are now adjusted in order to perform the anterior disconnection properly. And as you can see, we go down till the posterior part of the anterocranial fossa. And that's the olfactory tract which you can see deep down. And you can see that the arachnoid over the posterior part of anterocranial fossa comes into view.
So you can visualize the arachnoid very nicely over there. Now the middle disconnection is started at the end of the anterior disconnection and it passes in a sagittal direction posteriorly. So I started at the end of anterior disconnection but I pass it off in a sagittal direction straight posteriorly backwards and it would pass lateral to the head of the caudate nucleus putamen and then would pass lateral to the thalamus and it goes straight down till I reach to the temporal horn and that's the choroid fissure so the final part of middle disconnection is a portion where you connect the temporal horn with the body of the lateral ventricle at the level of the atrium. So that's the temporal horn which is now being exposed. So I prefer to suck off uh, the amygdala, especially the ventral amygdala, so that now it is disconnected from the dorsal amygdala because that is one portion uh, which is still connected uh, internally. So that's the amygdala being sucked off and that's the posterior part of the temporal horn which now comes into vision and you can very nicely see the choroid fissure curving around the choroid fissure going into the temporal horn. Now the final part of disconnection is the posterior disconnection which is uh, the short disconnection between the splenium and the choroid plexus. So that's the end of surgery and you can see that the opening is just about uh, 4 into 3 centimeters as the endoscope is pulled out. Now in order to show the posterior disconnection more nicely, I'm showing the short video where CP is the choroid plexus and it is joined with the splenium and when you cauterize and you disconnect you can see the uh, arachnoid over the galenic venous structures come into view and you can clearly see how the disconnection is performed. Now I find endoscope to be of an advantage because you can actually go under the choroid plexus and then disconnect it properly. So this is a view how it looks. Uh, this is a mechanism by which we perform the posterior disconnection which connects the choroid plexus to the splenium of the corpus callosum. Now this is a short video to show how the procedure looks in a non-atrophic case. So this is a case of a right hemispheric cortical dysplasia. So the entire procedure is absolutely the same and we follow the same three surgical steps. So uh, as you can see following the dural opening the brain looks maybe a slightly fuller as it would in case of as compared to as it would look in case of atrophic case in an atrophic patient. Now the hemisphere is retracted to one side and the cisterns are opened in the interhemispheric region using sharp dissection and both the A2s are exposed. So the brain may initially appear to be tight but with letting of CSF it becomes lax. <coughs> That's the splenium of corpus callosum. So these are the two A2s which are being separated before performing the corpus callosotomy. Now the anterior disconnection is started 
at the junction of Genu and the Atus. And because this is the right hemispherotomy, we are going to go on to the right side. If necessary, we can go, we can pass the endoscope lateral to the Atus. And you can see once the anterior disconnection is performed, now we are performing the middle disconnection. So the anatomical perspective is absolutely the same. And uh, but once the brain becomes lax, we are able to get more space. And that's the thalamus, and we are doing the final portion of the middle disconnection, which joins the temporal horn with the uh, body of the lateral ventricle. So that's the end of middle disconnection. And you can see that the temporal horn is now connected to the body of the lateral ventricle and atrium. It's important to suck out the blood which may collect in this area. And you can see the choroid plexus going around the choroid fissure. And that's performing the posterior disconnection which is between the choroid plexus and the splenium. So this shows the overall holistic view of the various disconnections which are performed, corpus callosotomy, anterior disconnection, middle disconnection and posterior disconnection and that's the post-op MRI. Now I feel that uh, endoscopic approach is also very useful to go under the craniotomy so as to visualize the bridging veins and this is particularly useful to visualize and cut the anterior bridging veins so that these do not tear off or bleed during the procedure and that shows the bridging veins anteriorly which have been cut and it's also useful to preserve the posterior bridging veins which I have done in this case as you can see because the retraction is so minimal so once you get some experience, you can actually preserve the posterior bridging veins if they come onto the surface, as it can be seen in this case. Once hemispherotomy over, you can see that the posterior bridging vein has been preserved. Uh, it may undergo slight vasospasm, but opens up with papaverin. Now in our experience, we have performed 29 cases of endoscopic hemispherotomies with a follow-up of over one year and when we compared it with uh, the outcomes of uh, standard open hemispherotomies they were equivalent including the neuropsychological outcomes which we have done a complete assessment in 20 patients so you can see that the scores do improve uh, significantly and uh, this is equivalent to that of standard open hemispherotomies However, the biggest advantage in, is in terms of its lesser blood loss as it can be seen here, smaller duration, shorter duration of surgery, excellent visualization, small size of craniotomy because it's minimally invasive and also lesser incidence of complications. So concluding, endoscopic hemispherotomy seems to be an effective, safe procedure with equivalent results as standard open hemispherotomy. It can be started initially with atrophic cases but with experience can be also performed in non-atrophic cases. It is minimally invasive with lesser blood loss and over a period of time the duration of surgery will also reduce. However, we have to understand that there is definitely a learning curve present. Finally, that's our center of excellence for epilepsy. Uh, as you can see, we have both the clinical, surgical, MEG and brain mapping arm along with advanced molecular and cellular astrophysiological facilities. And on behalf of the faculty, students and staff of the center, I thank everybody for giving us this opportunity to make this presentation. Thank you.